Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on crimes and punishments and in this lecture we shall have a look at the legal remedies in civil cases. Now we have seen before what a civil case is. A civil case is distinguished from a criminal case. In the case of a criminal case you have the whole state or the whole society getting offended because of the offence. And so the whole state uh, starts a suit to punish the offender. The main objective is to punish the offender. In the civil cases, on the other hand, you have two people who have a certain interaction. And in this interaction, one of them has uh, been offended. One of them has lost his rights or liberties or they have been encroached upon. And so, civil cases are cases of A versus B. That is, in the case of a criminal case, it will be something like the state versus A or the king or the uh, queen that is Rex or Regina versus A. And in these cases, the objective is to punish A. In the case of a civil case, it will go like A versus B. So, there is a person called A who is a plaintiff who is putting up a case against B who is a defendant. And the objective here is to not to give a punishment, but to gain certain amount of compensation so that the injury is lessened or it is paid for. So that is a civil case. And in this lecture, we are looking at the legal remedies. What are the remedies that law provides for the civil cases? Now, CPC or the Civil Procedure Code or the Code of Civil Procedure lays down the procedure to be followed in civil suits in India. So, this is a Code of Civil Procedure. So, this is a code means that it is a set of laws and rules that have been codified. So, they have been arranged in a certain format to give it a coherent structure. It deals with civil cases, not criminal cases. And it sets out the procedure. So, this is procedural law. This is not a substantive law. So, the CPC or the Civil Procedure Code lays down the procedure that is to be followed in civil suits in India. How is the CPC arranged? It has two parts. The first one is called the body of the code or the general principles of jurisdiction. And the body is divided into several sections, section 1 to 158. So, this is what we were referring to when we said that it is codified. It is arranged in the form of these sections followed by the first schedule. Now, the code also has second to fifth schedules that have been repealed. So, today the code only consists of the body and the first schedule. Now, the first schedule comprises of 51 orders and rules. The rules are made under these orders. So, 51 orders and rules they are under prescribing how the jurisdiction is to be exercised. So, this is a code. The code is divided into body and first schedule, 
body comprises of sections first schedule comprises of 51 orders and within each order you have several rules and all of these together are prescribing what is the procedure to be followed in civil cases now sections prevail over rules in case of inconsistency so basically the body of the code will dominate over the first schedule if there is any inconsistency between both of these the sections will prevail so they will be taken to be the correct things so let us look at the jurisdiction of courts which particular court is going to adjudicate the matter that is governed by section 9 of the cpc and section 9 says courts to try all civil suits unless barred the courts shall subject to the provisions herein contained have jurisdiction to try all suits of a civil nature excepting suits of which their cognizance is either expressly or impliedly barred and in this case jurisdiction is the competency of the court to take cognizance and divide and decide a matter so the cpc section 9 is saying that which what will be the jurisdiction of the courts the courts within the provisions contained in this code shall have the jurisdiction to try all suits of a civil nature except any suits where the their cognizance is either expressly or impliedly barred so the courts have been given a very wide jurisdiction all suits of civil nature unless so provided and what is civil nature civil nature means involving determination of civil rights such as title suits now we said that in the case of a right there is a title to the right so if you have a property the title will would say how did you get this property so title suit is a suit that establishes a title so if there is a question whether a is the owner of this property or b is the owner of this property then such a suit that is made to to come to this answer whether a is the owner or b is the owner that would be known as a title suit so this is again is a versus b money suits suits involving money matrimonial suits relating to marriage rights to office etc so the courts have jurisdiction or on all of these kinds of suits except in cases where their cognizance is expressly or impliedly barred expressly means that if there is a law or an act that is made that says that the court shall not have jurisdiction over such and such matters then that would be known as expressly barred or it may be impliedly barred because of certain other act so there could be an act that says the courts do not have jurisdiction or there could be um, a law that says that only such and such courts will be having this jurisdiction so in that case the other courts will be impliedly barred by that particular law now when we talk about jurisdiction there are three different types of jurisdiction you have territorial jurisdiction what are the geographical boundaries within which power can be exercised for example the territorial jurisdiction of the supreme court of india extends throughout the geography of india so all places in india if there are any suit in any place in india the supreme court has its territorial jurisdiction but a high court has a territorial jurisdiction only over those states for which this particular high court has been created so for example the high court of madhya pradesh will have territorial jurisdiction over madhya pradesh so any suit anywhere in madhya pradesh the high court will be having a, a territorial jurisdiction to decide upon that case so that is territorial jurisdiction what is the geographical boundary within which power can be exercised then we have pecuniary jurisdiction amount or value of the case that can be presented before the court based on the value of the relief claimed pecuniary means what is the amount of money 
so there can be limits that say that this court can only try cases up to an amount of 20 lakhs of rupees so in that case that particular court will have a pecuniary jurisdiction only to try cases that are worth 20 lakhs or less so that is pecuniary jurisdiction then third we have subject matter jurisdiction courts can be vested with power to decide certain subjects so we can have certain courts that decide on matrimonial disputes certain other courts that decide on money matters and so on so you can have courts that have separate subject matter jurisdictions so jurisdictions are divided into three categories territorial pecuniary and subject matter now section 15 of the cpc says court in which suits to be instituted every suit shall be instituted in the court of the lowest grade competent to try it so basically you can have several courts that have sufficient territorial pecuniary and subject matter jurisdiction but out of all those courts the court of the lowest grade that is competent to try it should be the one where the suit shall be instituted when we say shall be it means must be so every suit must be or has to be instituted in the court of the lowest grade that is competent to try it two points are important here court of the lowest grade and it should have competence that is it should have the jurisdiction now the honorable supreme court of india in this case hakam singh versus mrs gammon india limited in 1971 said that it is not open to the parties by agreement to confer their by their agreement jurisdiction on a court which it does not possess under the code that is if there is an agreement between two parties a and b and if in that agreement it is written that in case of any disputes the cases will be dealt with by such and such court of such and such location and if that court does not by the code automatically have the jurisdiction then the parties that are agreeing or that are making the agreement cannot by themselves confer this jurisdiction so the part it is not open to the parties by agreement so parties by agreement cannot do this what by to confer by their agreement jurisdiction on a court which it does not possess under the code so they cannot overrule the code now if there is a suit for an immovable property then we have to take care of two things one where is the property situated so in the case of an immovable property you will have to put a suit or to institute a suit at the place where the property is located if you have a property in lucknow then the place of suing will be lucknow as per section 16 of the cpc and if the property is such that it is located in the jurisdiction of multiple courts then it can be tried in any one of the courts that is if you have a very large size property and this property falls in the jurisdiction of multiple courts so multiple courts have the territorial jurisdiction to try this case so in that case the suit may be filed in any one of the courts by section 17 so this is about the immovable property if you have an a dispute about an immovable property then the suit must be be, uh, be uh, instituted either where the property is situated or if it, it is situated in the jurisdictions of multiple courts then in any one of those courts that is about the immovable property what about the movable property what about other things so section 19 says suits for compensation for wrongs to person or movables where a suit is for compensation for wrong done to the person or to movable property if the wrong was done within the local limits of the jurisdiction of one court and the defendant resides 
or carries on business or personally works for gain within the local limits of the jurisdiction of another court the suit may be instituted at the option of the plaintiff in either of the said courts what is it saying suppose there is a suit between two people a and b and a is the complainant that is a is filing the complaint against b so b is the defendant in this case so if it is a suit for compensation for wrong done to the person that is a is saying in this case that b has wronged me so it is a suit for compensation of wrong done to one person in this case a or to movable property so basically if say a says that b has taken away my car so it is a case for a movable property so where a suit is for compensation for wrong done to the person or to movable property if the wrong was done within the local limits of the jurisdiction of one court and the defendant resides or carries on business or personally works for gain within the local limits of the jurisdiction of another court that is if a and b are the parties and they had an interaction say in lucknow but b resides in kanpur so in this case the case may be filed either in lucknow or in kanpur the wrong if the wrong was done within the limits within the local limits of jurisdiction of one court and the defendant resides or carries on business or personally works for gain within the local limits of the jurisdiction of another court so there are two courts that are involved then the suit may be instituted at the option of the plaintiff so in this case the plaintiff that is the complainant that is a in this case would decide he has the option whether to file the case in lucknow or to file the case in kanpur illustrations a residing in delhi beats b in calcutta so there is this person b who was beaten by a and where was this beating done in calcutta so b may sue a either in calcutta where this wrong was uh, uh, where this wrong happened or in delhi where the defendant ordinarily resides or carries on business or personally works for gain similarly a residing in delhi publishes in calcutta statements defamatory of b so in this case b was wronged a did the wrong and this wrong was done in calcutta so b may sue a in calcutta but b also has the option of suing a in delhi where a resides so b may sue a either in calcutta or in delhi now of course if the wrong also happened in the same place where the defendant resides so then there is no doubt there is only one place where the suing can be done but if the wrong happened at one place and the defendant resides or carries on business or works for gain somewhere else then the plaintiff has an option of where to file the suit so this is what this particular section is telling us then section 2 says other suits to be instituted where defendants reside or cause of action arises so other suits that are not the suits of either immovable property or of compensation of wrongs done to person or movables any suits other than these are to be instituted where defendants reside or cause of action arises that is even in this case what the section is saying that if you have two people a and b 
and A is the plaintiff, meaning that he was wronged and B is the defendant who did the wrong and this wrong was done at a place P but B resides at resides or carry on, carries on business or works for gain at a place Q. So, this section is saying other suits are to be instituted where defendants reside. So, because A is instituting the case, so the benefit will be given to B. The case will not be lost where A resides. The case will be lost where B resides or the cause of action arises. So, this place P. So, the case can be suited or instituted at Q or at P. Illustrations A is a tradesman in Calcutta and B carries on business in Delhi. B by his agent in Calcutta buys goods of A and requests A to deliver them to the East Indian Railway Company. A delivers the goods accordingly in Calcutta. Now, A may sue B for the price of goods either in Calcutta where the cause of action has arisen or in Delhi where B carries out business. So, you can either lodge your suit in the place where the wrong happened or you can lodge it where the defendant resides or carries on business. So, this is what section 20 is telling us. Another illustration, A resides at Shimla, B at Calcutta and C at Delhi. A, B and C being together at Benares, B and C make a joint promissory note payable on demand and deliver it to A. Then A may sue B and C at Benares where the cause of action arose or he may sue them at Calcutta where B resides or at Delhi where C resides. But in each of these cases, if the non-resident defendant objects, the suit cannot proceed without the leave of the court. So, this illustration is telling us that there are three people A, B and C. A lives in Shimla, B lives in Kolkata and C lives in Delhi. Now, all these three together met in Benares. And at Benares, B and C made a joint promissory note payable on demand. That is, they have written a promissory note that if you present this note back to us, then we are going to pay you such and such amount of money. And they deliver it to A. So, this delivery was done at Benares. Now, if B and C do not pay A when he presents this note, this promissory note, then A may sue B and C. Now, where can he sue? He can sue either in Banaras because the cause of action, making of this joint promissory note and delivering it, it happened in Banaras. So, A may sue B and C at Banaras where the cause of action arose or he may sue B and C at their residences, that is at Calcutta or at Delhi. But the thing is, if the case is instituted in Calcutta and C objects or if the case is instituted in Delhi and B objects. So, if there is an objection, then if the non-resident defendant objects, then the suit cannot proceed without the leave of the court. Without the leave is without the permission of the court. So, if the defendants raise an issue that we will not be able to come to such and such place because we do not reside there. In that case, you have to take a special permission from the court. Only then the suit may be proceeded. Now, let us look at some definitions when we talk about civil cases. We have been talking about these things. Suit, parties, plaintiff, defendant, what are these? So, a suit is an original civil proceeding between two or more rivals. 
so there are two or more people and they are putting up a, a civil proceeding they are instituting a civil proceeding and this is an original civil proceeding meaning that it is not there on appeal it is the first proceeding that they are putting up so this first proceeding will be known as a suit parties are the rival set of contesting persons in a suit so parties comprises of the plaintiff and the defendant plaintiff is the person approaching the court seeking relief so the person who institutes the case against someone else is the plaintiff and the other party against whom the case has been instituted or the suit has been filed is the defendant and both of these together are known as parties to the case defendant is the party against whom the suit is filed and the relief is sought now in any case there may be more than one plaintiff and more than one defendant so there can be multiple plaintiffs and defendants in a single suit now order 1 rule 3 now remember that when we talked about cpc we said that the cpc is divided into sections and then we have orders and rules now this is saying order 1 rule 3 that is rule 3 made under order 1 says who may be joined as defendants who can be defended all persons may be joined in one suit as defendants where any right to relief in respect of or arising out of the same act or transaction or series of acts or transactions is alleged to exist against such persons whether jointly severally or in the alternative that is all those persons can be joined together as defendants in a suit where any right to relief in respect of or arising out of the same act or transaction for example in the previous example we said that there is this transaction that happened in uh, banaras by b and c and so in this case b and c together may be joined as defendants because the right to relief in respect of or arising out of the same act or transaction or there may be series of acts or transactions is alleged to exist against such persons so it is against both b and c so both both b and c can join together can, or can be joined together as the defendants and if separate suits were brought against such persons any common question of law or fact would arise that is if we were to take b and c separately if we were to file two cases in that case a common question of law or fact would arise what is a common question of law it means that the same law is applicable to both of those what is a common question of fact the same fact applies to both of these so basically if the act is common multiple people are involved and if you were to file separate suits then common questions would arise in that case you would club them together and make them defendants in a single suit so this is what order 1 rule 3 is saying next we have necessary parties a party is considered necessary in a suit now remember party means plaintiff and defendant so a party is considered necessary in a suit if no effective or meaningful decision can be arrived at in his absence so if a party is a necessary party it means that if you do not have this party then you cannot have an effective or meaningful decision in the event of a necessary party not having been joined the suit is liable to be rejected due to non joinder if there is a necessary party and you have not joined that party in the suit then the suit may be rejected and the reason will be known as non joinder of the necessary party this comes from order 1 rule 9 proviso sometimes an unnecessary party is joined so you can add 
as a defendant a, uh, or as a plaintiff a person who has got nothing to do and if you have such an unnecessary party who has been joined in the suit it is known as misjoinder miss is wrong so there is a wrong joinder but the suit does not suffer from such misjoinder that is just because you have added an extra person does not mean that the suit will be rejected if you have not added a necessary party the suit is liable to be rejected but you have added an extra party who was not required then even though there is a misjoinder the suit will not be rejected just because you have added an extra party so this is what this particular rule is saying order 1 rule 9 then we can define pleading pleading shall mean a plaint or a written statement order 6 rule 1 it is defining pleading pleading means a plaint or a written statement so what are these pleadings are statements in writing drawn up and filed by each party to a case stating what is his con- what his contention will be at the trial and giving all such details as his opponent needs to know to prepare his case in answer so pleadings are statements and these statements have to be put down in writing so these are statements in writing by the parties to the case that is by the plaintiffs and the d- defendant so these are statements in writing drawn up and filed by each party to a case and these statements state what their contention will be at the trial what do they have to say and giving all such details as his opponent needs to know to prepare his case in answer and these can be plaints or written statements plaint is the pleading of the plaintiff the detailed application submitted by the plaintiff in the court seeking relief against the defendant so when a fresh suit is being filed then the first application the detailed application that is submitted by the plaintiff which tells what are the details of the case and what is the relief that the plaintiff is seeking so this is known as a plaint now when a plaint has been filed there will be a response by the defendant and that response is known as a written statement so the defendant's detailed reply to the plaint filed to contest the suit so in the written statement the defendant will say that no what the plaintiff is saying is false this was not the law this was not the fact and so on and so this uh, particular suit may be dismissed so that would be the uh, written statement that will be filed by the defendant to contest the suit so the first thing would be plaint in reply to the plaint there will be the written statement now once the plaintiff re- receives this written statement he can put on a further pleading so this further pleading done by the plaintiff is known as a replication now once the plaintiff has filed a replication then again the ball will go to the court of the defendant and the reply of the defendant to the further pleadings that is the reply of the defendant to the replication is known as rejoinder so when we say that we are going to file a rejoinder it means that we are going to file a reply against the replication when we say we are filing a written statement it is a reply against the plaint replication is a reply against the written statement or the rejoinder so it is also possible that after the the rejoinder there can be a further pleading by the plaintiff so there can be a replication again to which there can be a further rejoinder now it is important to note here that pleadings are not evidence they are just statements by the two parties now when the plaints have been filed then the court has the option to return the plaint or to reject the plaint return is governed by order 7 rule 10 so a plaint may be returned for presentation in proper court 
so we saw before that the court of the lowest grade that is competent to try a case should be the one that tries the case now if the plaintiff has submitted his plaint in another court in that case the plaint may be returned back for presentation in the proper court so you take it from here and you present it in the proper court but if this return is made after the defendant has appeared then it is important or necessary to intimate the defendant before returning the plaint so that is return but the plaint may also be rejected under order 7 rule 11 in the following cases one it does not disclose a cause of action so a person has written a plaint and it is unclear because he is he has not disclosed what is the cause of action because of which he is filing this plaint so the court may just reject this plaint where the relief claimed is undervalued and the plaintiff on being required by the court to correct the valuation within a time to be fixed by the court fails to do so what do you mean by undervalued it means that suppose you are filing a suit and the property in question is worth 10 lakhs of rupees and to save on the court fees in your plaint you have written that it's not worth 10 lakhs of rupees it is just worth 1 lakh of rupees and the court has intimated you that you are you, that you have undervalued the this uh, property to save on your fees so if the court has told this that the relief is undervalued and the plaintiff on being required by the court to correct the valuation within the, the time fixed by the court even after that the plaintiff is not doing that so in that case the plaint may be rejected or where the relief claimed is properly valued but the plaint is returned upon paper insufficiently stamped so he has not sufficiently stamped that is he has not paid the sufficient fees and the plaintiff on being required by the court to supply the requisite stamp paper within a time to be fixed by the court fails to do so then again it can be rejected or where the suit appears from the statements in the plaint to be barred by any law so if there is any law that has barred such a suit then it will be rejected by the court or where the plaint is not filed in duplicate now why duplicate because one copy remains with the court and the second copy is sent to the defendant but if the plaintiff has not uh, submitted the file in duplicate then the court may reject it or where the plaintiff fails to comply with the provisions of rule 9 what is provisions of rule 9 we have seen it before this one that is if the necessary party has not been joined then the suit is liable to be rejected due to non joinder that is again another reason for rejection of a plaint now rejection of a plaint does not preclude presentation of fresh plaint so if a plaint has been rejected then the person has the option to put up a fresh plaint now what about the written statements written statement is to be filed within 30 or 90 days of service as given in order 8 rule 1 so the defendant cannot take an infinite amount of time there is a time limit fixed to submit the written statement what should it contain it should contain the documents relied upon in defense it is a duty of the defendant to produce the documents relied on he can put in a specific plea of new facts so he can say that these are the facts that have not been mentioned in the plaint by the plaintiff he can do specific denials he can say that no what is written in the plaint is false so he can specifically deny something the important thing is there must not be evasive denials it has to be clear you cannot evade the denials and failure to deny specifically causes presumption of admission subject to the court's discretion 
that is if the plaint says that you have beaten me and in your written statement you do not say that that you have not beaten me then the court is going to presume it is the discretion of the court to presume that yes you have beaten me so this is what this particular rule is saying failure to deny specifically causes presumption of admission so the court may may presume that you are admitting to what is written in the plaint subject to the court's discretion now when a suit is duly instituted and admitted then summons are to be issued to the defendant to appear and answer the claim so this is the process of summoning summon is to call somebody and the summon should contain the name of the court which is this court where it is located the purpose for which the presence of the defendant is required so you have to state the purpose why do you want to call this person it should have the date and time of appearance when should this person appear what date what time signature of the judge or the appointed officer so you cannot send an unsigned summons and it should have the seal of the court now summons must be accompanied by a copy of the plaint so this is why the plaint has to be submitted in duplicate summons must order the defendant to produce all documents or copies which he or she intends to rely upon but no summons need to be issued where the defendant appears on the date of presentation of plaint and admits the claim of the plaintiff so it may so appear or or it may so happen that on the date on which the plaintiff comes to the court to file the plaint the defendant has also come and the the defendant says yes sir whatever is written is correct so in that case the court does not have to issue a summons once the summons have been issued they have to be served to be to the defendant so this is the service of the summons so once you have prepared this document that is known as the summons that consists all of all of these things the name purpose date time signature stamp seal so if you have this document which is the summons how do you serve it so the cpc says that service to the defendant may be done in different ways there can be a direct personal service on the defendant if living within the jurisdiction of the court of institution so basically a person or an officer from the court can go and give the summons directly to the defendant and this is done if the defendant is living within the jurisdiction of the court where the plaint has been instituted where the suit has been instituted so it can be given directly to the person or it can be given to the authorized agent authorized agent in most cases means the lawyer of the person who is living within the jurisdiction of the court of institution of plaint or it may even be served to an adult family member of the defendant you cannot give it to a child it has to be an adult family member and the service to an adult family member can only be done if the defendant was not there if the de- if the defendant was absent and there is no likelihood of being found at his residence within a reasonable time and no authorized agent is available to receive the summons now in this case courts have ruled that servant is not a member of the family when it says it has to be served to an adult family member you cannot just give it to a servant and leave other option is by fixing where defendant agent or family member refuses to accept the summons or cannot be found so if a person is uh, given the summons and this person says no i am not going to take it so what are the options to serve this summons you can fix it somewhere where the serving officer will affix a copy of the summons on the front door or some conspicuous part of the house so a, a copy will be stuck to the front door or some conspicuous place where the defendant ordinarily resides carries on business or personally works for gain so at this location the serving officer will just stick a copy 
and return the original summons with endorsement which says that the copy of the summons has been fixed circumstances in which it was done that is who was present and who refused to take the summons and name and address of the person if any who identified the house and witnessed the delivery that is a respectable member of the society who lives nearby has to be there somebody should tell the serving officer that yes this is the house of this particular person and he or she should have seen this fixing so that if the court ever wants to identify uh, to uh, cross check then there should be a witness now the court will examine the serving officer and then declare whether the summons have been duly served or not if they have not been duly served then the court may order other service other option is by post so summons may be served by registered post acknowledgement due that is ad speed post a courier service if it is approved by the high court or by fax and email if the high court has approved that another option to serve is through the plaintiff on application from the plaintiff so in certain cases the plaintiff may say that the defendant is my relative he or she is my brother or my cousin or so on and so please give the summons to me i will serve it to him but there has to be an application from the plaintiff to do a service through the plaintiff another option is a substituted service where the court is satisfied that there is reason to believe that the defendant is keeping out of the way to avoid service it may order substituted service that is the defendant is running away how do you, what do you do then so in that case the substituted service can be done by affixing a copy in a conspicuous place in the courthouse so you can even stick the summons in the courthouse and it will be considered deemed to be a substituted service or affixing copy in a conspicuous part of house where the defendant is known to have last resided or carried on business or personally worked for gain so you do not know his current house so in that case you can affix the copy in a conspicuous place of the last known uh, residence or place of business and so on or the court may order publication in the newspaper or beating of drums in the local area and that is known as substituted service now the important thing here is the court order has to be obtained first and services to be made later now if a suit has been filed and people do not appear later on what will happen then if neither party appears the plaintiff is not there the defendant is not there on the due date in that case the court may dismiss the suit the court may allow this suit to remain or the court may dismiss so it's the discretion of the court if the plaintiff appears and the defendant does not appear so in that case the court can proceed ex parte that is without the the defendant because the defendant has been given uh, a, an enough opportunity to present his case but the defendant is not coming so the court can proceed ex parte if the defendant appears but the plaintiff does not appear so in that case the court shall dismiss meaning the court has to dismiss the suit it cannot go on many plaintiffs and one or more defendant appear and others do not in that case the court may permit the suit to proceed as if everybody has appeared if many defendants and one or more plaintiff appear and others do not then the court may proceed as if appeared and pass appropriate judgment at the uh, appropriate order at the time of the judgment so two things are important here if plaintiff appears defendant does not appear then there can be an ex parte case but if the defendant appears and the plaintiff does not appears then the court shall dismiss then how does this suit proceed we have the framing of issues framing of issues is the hearing of a suit is split into two parts there is the first hearing at which issues are framed 
So that is the first hearing and then later on we will say that there is a hearing. So in a hearing the evidence is taken of the parties and their witnesses. So the first hearing is to frame the issues, what are the issues in this case and the subsequent hearings are to take the evidence. Issues arise when any material propositions of fact or law are affirmed by one party and denied by the other. If both of them say that yes this thing happened then there is no issue. But if one of the party says that x happened and the other says that x did not happen then there is an issue. So that is the issues. So we have first hearing and subsequent hearings. Now order 23 talks about withdrawal of the suit. So if a suit has been filed it may be withdrawn later on and there are two types of withdrawals. One is absolute withdrawal. In the case of absolute withdrawal, you do not need the leave of the court. You do not require the permission of the court because the court has no power to refuse permission. The suit will be dismissed with cause, but an absolute withdrawal makes you precluded from bringing a fresh suit. So you cannot bring in a new suit for the same thing or you can have a qualified withdrawal with the permission of the court in cases where the suit is likely to fail for some formal defect or where there are sufficient grounds for allowing the plaintiff to file suit for the same subject matter or part of the claim. So in these cases, you can take the permission of the court and you can withdraw the case. There can also be a compromise. It is open to the parties to a suit to compromise the suit, settle the dispute between them and apply for a decree in terms of compromise and it is a duty of the court to pass the decree in accordance with the compromise provided the compromise is lawful. If it is illegal then the court, then the court will not allow with this. Compromise must be in writing and signed by the parties or their counsels or lawyers. Then we have abatements. A suit becomes redundant due to a person ceasing to exist as a party. In some cases, if a person dies off or if the person is no longer there because of any XYZ reason, then there can be abatement. It applies to both the sides, the plaintiff and the defendant. No abatement on party's death if right to sue survives. So if a party dies, but the right to sue survives in their uh, heirs. So in that case, there will not be an abatement. There will also not be an abatement if death happens after hearing. Substitution of legal representatives to be effected within 90 days from date of death, otherwise the suit will abate as per section 120 of Limitation Act. So if somebody has died, then within 90 days, you have to substitute the legal representatives or else the case will end. And fresh suit on the same cause of action is barred if there has been an abatement. So this is another process. Then we have interlocutory orders. Inter is in between. Locus is to say something. So this is an order that is given between two sayings. Any reasoned order on a party's petition during the pendency of a suit to provide him interim relief or temporary injunction such as order for interim sale of movable property subject to speedy and natural decay. Suppose there is a suit for tomatoes that are there in a truck, a truck load of tomatoes. Now by the time the suit goes on, the tomatoes will degenerate. So in that case, rule 6 of order 39 says that the court can give an interlocutory order for interim sale of the movable property. So the court can say that okay, you sell this property and deposit the money with the court. And this money will be given to whichever party wins the case. Or order regarding detention, preservation and inspection of suits subject matter, rule 7. So these are two kinds of or two examples of interlocutory order. Then we have injunctions. An injunction is a judicial remedy prohibiting persons from doing a specified act or commanding them 
to undo some wrong or injury. We have seen injunctions before. So, it is a judicial remedy which prohibits persons from doing something or asks them to do something, typically to undo something that they have done wrongly. Injunctions may be mandatory. So, mandatory means it is compulsory for the party to do something and these are very uncommon. The common things are prohibitory or preventive injunctions which restrain somebody from doing something. So, these are more common and frequent. Now, temporary injunctions continue for a specific time or until orders of the court. They may be granted at any stage of the suit even before the summons and they are governed by CPC order 39. Permanent injunctions on the other hand can be granted only by a decree made at the hearing upon the merits of the suit. So, it can only be given at the very end when the decree is made. The defendant is perpetually enjoined from commission of the act and these are governed by the specific relief act sections 38 to 42. Then we have judgment. Judgment is the statement given by the judge on the grounds of a decree or order. So, when at the end when a decree or an order is made, what are the grounds on which this decree or order is being made? The statement that is given by the judge on the grounds is known as the judgment. The judgment may be given immediately after completion of hearing or on some future date with notice, typically within 30 days or in extraordinary circumstances not beyond 60 days with notice to both the sides. Now, along with a judgment, you will have a decree. Decree is the formal expression of adjudication. That is, at the end of all this hearing, what is, uh, what has been adjudicated? It conclusively determines the rights of the parties. So, it will say that, okay, property belongs to A or property belongs to B. Regarding all or any of the matters in controversy in the suit. So, it is a formal expression of adjudication conclusively determining the rights of the parties regarding all or any of the matters in controversy in the suit. Now, once a decree has been made, there has to be its execution. Execution is the enforcement of the decree or the order. So, through the, the decree, the court said that this property belongs to A, but then this is just a piece of paper. The enforcement of this piece of paper is known as execution. It is done by the process of the court so as to enable the decree holder to realize the fruits of the judgment, decree or order. So, once a decree has been made, it will be executed. And lastly, we have appeal, reference, review and revision. Appeal is an application to a higher court for reconsideration of, de of decision of a lower court and right of appeal is conferred by statute. So, if you are not happy with the, the decision, you can always make an application to the higher court and this is known as appeal. Typically, the higher courts deal more with matters of law and less with matters of fact. Then reference, a subordinate court may refer a question of law to the higher court. So, in the case of a reference, the parties do not have to approach the higher court. The subordinate court may by itself refer a question of law to the higher court. Revision, high court has the power to call the record of any court, subordinate to it and pass an appropriate order and that is known as revision of the order. And then we also have review. Review is re-examination or second examination by the court which passed the order. So, the same court can review or the high court can revise. Any matter can be referred to a higher court by the subordinate court or the decision may be appealed against. So, this is all about the remedies in the civil cases. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.